Good morning everyone and welcome back to our continuing series of CPDs. This time it's all about getting to grips with giant hogweed. I'm Andy Ferguson from the Property Care Association and joining me today to talk about Everent Hogweed is Technical Director at ACORM and PCA Lecturer, Professor Max Wade. Good morning Max to you. Andy, good morning, how are you? Not bad, good sir, yourself? Good, yep. Very well, thank you. Yep. Well, folks, if you are one of our regular listeners, as always, a very big welcome back to you. Uh, if you are one of our new listeners, then a big welcome to you. And we really hope that you get some real good valued learning from today. And as always, uh, you, you enjoy the chat and you embrace the chat. Now, um, for uh, I do apologise to all of our regular listeners that have heard me say this spiel before, but for all those that don't know how to do this, if you, over the course of the presentation, want to ask a question or a query, you just want to say hello to us, then the first place I could point you over to is the chat functionality just within the platform. Now, if you're using a desktop, the chat functionality, depending on your settings, will either be just to the left or to the right of you. All you simply need to do is there's a box there that says type a comment, just simply fire whatever your question is or whatever your comment is and hit enter. If you're on a mobile device, it's very similar. All you need to do is just kind of just pull up the screen a wee bit. You will see that comments functionality just in there. Again, just hit the keyboard, say hello. I can see some of you are already saying good morning to us already. Good morning all. Good morning, Peter, Trevor, Lee, Martin, and George. Um, again, there is also other ways in which you can also pose any question to us over the course of the webinar. Uh, first place I'm pointing to is via email. You can email me directly and I will uh, pose the questions to Max at the end of the presentation. My email address is simply andy at property-care.org. That's andy at property-care.org. Or alternatively, if you are so socially savvy, of which some of our audience clearly is from questions that we've been getting in the past, you can go to our social media channels and you can pose the question that way. Or if you just want to go to our social media channels and say hello, we always like um, people giving us wee shout outs. We will always come back to you as well. So please feel free to do so. All you simply need to do is just go to either Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook hit the search functionality, uh, type in Property Care Association and we should pop up. Uh, just a note in case something might go wrong for you when you're actually viewing the presentation. I'm well aware that everyone's starting work at nine o'clock, turning on the computers. Joe Wicks going mad with the kiddies at nine o'clock and doing his PE for the nation, that there is quite a surge on the internet, and it has been known from time to time that uh, that that you may go down just because of the pool of the internet. If that happens, you will see a reconnect <coughs> button on your screen. All you simply need to do is basically hit that reconnect button, and you will be able to join us. And if anyone on the chat is seeing anyone having any trouble, please feel free just to let them know about that reconnect functionality. Um, Max, we've still got a couple of minutes just until we start the live presentation, and we've got a time to kill. Um, I suppose I'm, 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 I have to say, I am still a little bit gutted about our Invasive Week conference. Now, guys, just for those that are not in the know, Max Wade, as well as others, Jim Glaster that was on uh, just a couple of weeks ago as well, and also um, others from our Invasive Weeds, um, conference committee. Max very much heads up this conference committee and does a lot of work behind the scenes in terms of getting this conference up and running. And I have to say, Max, I mean, we were almost there. I mean, we were literally done. <laughs> yep. We, um, Murphy's Law, really, isn't it? The one year that you actually get it all together and uh, uh, in it, if it, as, as efficiently as we could possibly have done. And it was a really good programme. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's you know, the the people aren't going to go away. Um, the topics are going to be just as relevant once we come out of all of this. So uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll pull it all back together again. Well, guys, just to let you know, I mean, we we are certainly in the mindset of 2021. 
we had some cracking presentations that were lined up for this year. I'm pretty sure we can reuse them again. So certainly come later in the year, crossing fingers, depending on the COVID-19 crisis, hopefully you'll maybe start seeing some information about our 2021 conference. Um, Max, I was actually, funny enough, looking you up uh, on online and checking out your book. And I know you literally wrote the book on it. And as I actually say up my way, you are the gaffer. I suppose, in terms of kind of not weeds. However, I couldn't quite help but look at your title of the book, which is kind of fairly self-explanatory, which is called Giant Hogweed Management in the United Kingdom, just for our audience. However, I couldn't help but think if you jazzed up that title that little bit, you would have got a couple of more pound signs. And I was kind of thinking of some titles here for you, for your consideration now, playing off the day of the Triffids, for example, the day of the hogweed, plants on the rampage, how to fight back. I can see you're not quite impressed with my suggested title. <laughs> no, no, this way, well, you'll, yeah, so you've uh, you, you sort of um, picked up on, on, on other people's approaches as well as, uh, <laughs> as we'll say in a minute or two. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, the project was uh, funded by the Environment Agency, mm. so um, you know they would have uh, pr probably would have preferred something slightly more staid and uh, well, uh, less sensational. Um, mm. But uh, it is a uh, as we found with Japanese knotweed, we need to be careful of the sensationalism. Uh, we need to get things in in, in proportion, uh, and it's it it's one of an. A, Obviously, a number of, of of invasive plants that are giving us giving us trouble. So, um, it uh, needs we need to put it in its place. Guys, I hope you know I was just being flippant there, just for anyone that was kind of listening. Um, guys, for all our, our people that have just joined us quite recently, a big welcome to you to, and to our latest in our CPD series, all about getting to grips with giant hogweed. I'm Andy Ferguson from the PCA. And joining me today is Max, Professor Max Wade from ACOM and also PC Lecture. We are about to start. Just for those that have just joined us, if you do have any questions over the course of the webinar that you want to pose to Max, I would encourage you just to use the chat functionality on the desktop. should be just to the left or the right on a mobile. You just need to pull it up. Just basically plug in your question and fire it over to us. You can as well ask the question via email, send it to myself at andy at property-care.org. Um, I suppose it's at that time, Max, where we're kind of really kind of starting to get ready for passing it across to yourself. So I suppose raising the questions, how do we identify Japanese knotweed? Why is this plant such a pain in the butt? Sorry, that's my words. And what is the strategy for really kind of treating it? Max, I know this is right up your street. Over to yourself, good sir. Thank you, Andy. And um, it, it it is uh, giant hogweed, uh, not Japanese knotweed. Uh, but you're right. Um, that also is a pain in the uh, in the proverbial. Um, this morning, um, I'd like to talk you through various aspects of giant hogweed. Um, I couldn't resist adding in you know, a tall order. Um, it's a, a tall order to deal with this plant. It's got a, a number of aspects associated with it that make it tricky. Um, but it's also a tall order in, in a relatively short space of time to cover all of the uh, all of the aspects. And uh, there are there is some further reading that you can pick up um, at the uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, um, looking at those of you who are um, on the on the on the webinar as it were listening to the webinar uh, there's quite a bit of experience out there or already um so not only uh, take the opportunity to ask questions as we go along as andy's already encouraged you uh but uh, you know where you've got examples experience of working with giant hogweed um it could be tips on identification could be uh, experiences you've had of uh, removing the plant by excavation or whatever um do do chip chip in and, and add those in as we go um, to, in order to make the most of, 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 the, of the following hour. So you might be wondering, you know, why, you know, why are we here talking about this, this plant? Um, and maybe I'll just start off with a, a, a quote from the 
uh, Gardener's Magazine, um, John Henry Loudon writing in the mid uh, 19th century. We do not know of a more suitable plant for the retired corner of a churchyard or for a glade in a wood. And we have accordingly given one friend who is making a tour in the north of England and Ireland and another who is gone to Norway seeds for depositing in proper places. So thanks, John. Um, he and uh, a whole range of others um, have created uh, the problem that we now find in terms of uh, Jarrett Hogweed uh, and Alan Titchmarsh uh, today or a few years ago, uh, clearly jumping on a bit of a bandwagon in terms of the uh, issues uh, associated with giant hogweed. So let's let's explore just what sort of a problem it is. How do we identify it? Uh, how can we plan and um, deal with it uh, where where indeed it, it needs to be dealt with? But first off, um, let's just put up a sign, um, making sure that everybody knows that it's a potential problem. Uh, let's put up a, a, a fence uh, around it, um, keeping people away while we make up our minds what to do with it. Uh, it is that sort of plant, uh, mainly due to its uh, sort of risks from a, from a health point of view, uh, that we need to keep away from people right from the outset as soon as uh, we discover it. And clearly it is a problem. Uh, part of the genesis of this morning's presentation is um, media coverage during the COVID shutdown. Uh, it's been fantastic weather up till recently. Um, everybody getting out much more, um, more time, uh, particularly with youngsters out there uh, to contact, uh, get in contact with the plant and uh, to get injured by it. So it is uh, it is a, a very much focus at the moment. So a good time to uh, have a look at it. But actually, if you go back to if I go back to my Google alerts in nine, in 2014, uh, for the first six months of the year, I had 20 Google alerts pop up uh, dealing with um, that's just Heraclium mantigazianum, the scientific name for giant hogweed. Um, but a giant hogweed as well was a, a similar number. So a plant to be reckoned with. Um, and uh, within ACOM, we uh, we always start our uh, meetings, presentations, etc., with a, a sort of a safety thought, if you like, a safety moment. Uh, and, and mine would be um, particularly those of us who are out dealing with giant hogweed or might come into contact with it, just make sure you've got some water available. Um, it, it's ever so easy just to wash down and uh, almost problem solved if you come into contact accidentally with the plant. Um, and also, or alternatively, make sure you've got some clothing to cover up if you've been wearing a T-shirt or even sort of shorts, uh, a shirt and a pair of trousers or whatever, cover up because uh, the chemical in giant hogweed doesn't react without sunlight. So uh, some water and cover up uh, would be my uh, sort of top tip in terms of making sure that you don't actually get hurt by this plant. Although interestingly, um, the main uh, problem uh, with, with the giant hogweed is, is almost certainly flood defense, um, health certainly, uh, reduction in biodiversity, um, problems in getting to particularly rivers, and also the costs uh, and time delays uh, in relation to development. Here, uh, here's the River Tweed, a fairly huge stand of, of uh, giant hogweed. Um, river's quite low at this point. You can imagine um, later on in, in the year or a summer summer high precipitation in the, in the summer, uh, water rises and the plant's going to uh, create quite a resistance uh, in terms of flow and potential backing up of the water and and flooding. Um, interestingly, uh, on this particular site, uh, well treated with a herbicide, you can see uh, in the in the bottom right there the the plant dying back, very effectively treated. Uh, what they hadn't appreciated though was that the uh, roots, uh, it's like a parsnip um, tap root, uh, sort of shriveled up and, and, and started to, to decay, leaving literally thousands of little holes in the ground. So when it did, um, water did rise, unfortunately, 
it uh, undermined the bank and the whole lot slipped into the uh, river. So, you know, we need to plan carefully and, and think about uh, how we deal with this plant. It's got a sort of whole range of, 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 of hidden uh, challenges. So um, tried not to be too graphic in terms of the uh, health problems, um, not in terms of any sensitivity, but just trying to keep things in, in proportion. This is a fairly typical sort of reaction uh, in terms of blistering. Um, you have to touch the, the plant. Um, any part of the plant will do. Uh, reaction with sunlight um, and you, you, after an hour or so, um, will get a, a blistering or alternatively some people uh, get more of a rash um, and feedback is that the um, the problem is more the following year when you take your put your t-shirt on for the first time go out in the, the sunlight um, and the the, uh, the rash will come back up again and could do so for a number of years and it's this recurrence uh, that really makes the plant uh, unpleasant um, and one that we need to take seriously in terms of health and safety. Um, yeah, you're not going to have much joy trying to live under a dense stand of giant hogweed, uh, hence the problems for a whole range of um, plants. Also, it, it reduces the biodiversity of, of, can reduce the biodiversity of insects, makes it very difficult to get down. Uh, particularly to the riverbank. I'm thinking here of anglers. This is River Shannon, where it was a, a serious problem feeding white back into bed and breakfast restaurants um, patronised by um, anglers who just couldn't get to the River Shannon, so didn't bother to come, and it was a sort of a local uh, ec economic issue. And economics, again, uh, where you need to remove the plant, particularly if you're going to be digging it out, um, seeds as well as roots and so on. Um, this is expensive and uh, causes uh, delays. Apologies for the incorrect uh, title there. Um, so what do we have to do? Uh, in terms of legislation, we, we have to make sure that we don't cause the plant to um, spread into the into the wild, um, Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, as with Japanese knotweed, those of you who are involved in dealing with this plant, um, the, the legislation is, is again quite similar in terms of the Environmental Protection Act. The soil that contains hogweed seeds uh, becomes a controlled waste and we have to take it to a licensed landfill. Curiously, um, Japanese knotweed uh, and giant hogweed were the original plants on the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. Uh, Japanese knotweed went on to achieve great fame um, and cause huge uh, costs, particularly in relation to um, having to dispose of it at uh, registered landfill sites. Giant hogweed never made quite the same headlines, curiously enough, uh, but the legislation is the same and that is what you should do. Um, Antisocial Crime Policing Act actually did um, get uh, did mention the Home Office did mention specifically giant hogweed in their initial release, and it, it is possible to secure community protection notices to deal with it. More recently, the Invasive uh, Alien Species uh, Order um, includes uh, giant hogweed, and uh, there is the potential for enforcement orders to be issued. And this is, is is valuable, particularly at a sort of a regional um, landscape sort of scale, um, but wouldn't normally be used in terms of some of the sort of site work that uh, that we might do. Town and Country Planning Act um, covers nuisance, particularly health nuisance, very effectively used in Edinburgh against uh, in terms of dealing with a giant hogweed infestation. But at the end of the day, you're more likely to find common law is the piece of legislation that uh, you may need to deal with. A local authority, for example, where somebody has um, been uh, injured as a result of giant hogweed on their property or indeed any any property uh, holder where uh, damage uh, has been has been caused would uh, would fall under common law. 
Uh, two bits of guidance that are, are, are worth uh, reminding you about. Um, the regulatory position statement, RPS, RPS 178, provides very useful information in terms of treating and disposing of giant hogweed amongst sort of in, invasive non-native plants. Uh, and DEFRA in 2013 provided advice in terms of removing soil up to four metres away from the plants and down to um, 0.5 metres. Uh, with, a, with a, a caveat associated with that. So those are things we must do or guidance we really ought to follow. But what, what a, you know, what, what is this plant? How do we, how do we recognize it? Um, well, firstly, just, just for the record, um, there, there is almost certainly more than one species or type of giant hogweed in the UK that you may sort of come up, come, uh, come across. There's, uh, the giant hogweed, as Persian, Sosnovskis and Lehmanns are all other possibilities. Um, there's even one of these that occurs in, in Buckingham Palace Gardens. However, firstly, the majority is, of it is uh, recognised to be giant hogweed, Heraclium mantigasianum. Uh, and secondly, uh, they are, because they're very difficult to distinguish uh, in terms of identification, not surprisingly, uh, they are they are going to respond to the the same sort of planning treatment etc. So we're dealing with giant hogweed um, and let's have a look at some of the uh, key features uh, in terms of the seeds. It certainly produces a lot of them. They're penny sized, paper thin, oval shaped, and they've got uh, characteristic uh, dark stripes in them. If you look at the seed in the middle there, you can see just about make out four of those oil ducts, uh, which are quite characteristic of uh, giant hogweed uh, as, as a plant. Um, have a carefully have a have a, have a sniff. Uh, the seeds actually have quite a characteristic um, odor. The whole plant has a, a smell associated with it, which when, once you have uh, sniffed it a few times, um, will will certainly help you in terms of recognition, um, and the leaves uh, on the whole are are, are pretty spectacular, um, large, bright, lush, dark green. Um, that got sort of divided, saw like edges, uh, and really quite bristly. Um, mentioning things like bristly, etc. Again, be careful. Uh, you, you really mustn't touch touch the plant. So use uh, gloves. Uh, protection uh, if you're going to start investigating it in, in any detail. It starts out in terms of the leaves that are obviously they're, they're very small, um, start to increase in, in size and uh, as as they develop uh, will produce the sort of characteristics that, that can be quite useful. So if you lean forward and look fairly carefully at the base of the leaf stalk of that of this seedling You'll notice uh, that there are already some bristles appearing on it, and also it's got a sort of a purpley colour. Um, two useful clues that this might be a, a, a giant, a giant hogweed um, seedling. It'll start to grow bigger uh, and bigger. Um, stand of the plant emerging early in the year in a in a, in a floodplain, uh, and you can see that dissected um, saw edge sort of sort of appearance. Uh, and the plant is. Um, certainly lives up to its name. Uh, it is giant, uh, and I think this is a, an important characteristic to remember. It, it really, it has to be giant in order to be uh, giant hogweed. So yeah, up to five meters tall. Uh, substantial stems in terms of their diameter, hollow um, with, with nodes along them, and again bristly. And these purple blotches can be uh, really quite useful. Um, here's the stem emerging at the, at the, the base. You can see the bristles uh, and you can see the blotchiness, but it is a variable plant. Uh, the leaves can be variable, the stem can be variable. You can just about see some purpley bits on there, but you can't actually see many bristles. Uh, that's another giant hogweed stem, just uh, indicating the extreme of uh, sort of var variance. So look for a range of characteristics before you jump to the conclusion that it uh, is giant hogweed and not one of the sort of many other um, plants that have a, a similar um, umbrella, um, flower, tall, 
hollow hollow stems. There are, there are a number of them. So here's the plant uh, stems at the end of the year, along with um, seed flower or dead flower heads. Um, again, it's it's huge, um, and the the stems sort of remain that uh, retain that sub substantial aspect. Clearly, it produced lots of flowers. These are tiny uh, and uh, comprise a uh, an umbrella shaped flower head um, of a huge thing, 80 centimeters or so across. Um, and there are also smaller flower heads uh, on, on the side arms. So again, it's a, a, a characteristic plant, um, difficult uh, on its own just to realize that that is, is almost a meter across in terms of size, uh, really large, although the individual flowers themselves are really quite tiny. So what could we confuse it with? Um, common hogweed's probably the, uh, the one that you're most likely to conf confuse it with. Uh, it's much uh, shorter, and not, not as tall, sort of about sort of two meters or so. The leaves, uh, generally speaking, are, uh, are much more, much less uh, sort of dissected, if you like, um, are, and got more sort of overall sort of leaf area associated with them. Um, Size-wise, the leaves are very different. Giant hogweed on the top, um, common hogweed uh, below. Uh, and then if we lay them side by side, again, I think you can start to see my point in terms of the giant hogweed um, living, up to, living up to its name. Um, giant hogweed is on the, uh, on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, um, common hogweed uh, on, on the left. Even the seeds, um, giant hogweed on the on the left, uh, common hogweed on the right, uh, are different in terms of, of, of sizes. So um, size means a lot in terms of this identification. A plant that is of similar stature to giant hogweed is hemlock. Um, it's a much less substantial plant, um, and the leaves are finely finely divided, almost a sort of ferny, um, flimsy. Uh, and the, the flower heads are, are much smaller. But as I think you'll see uh, here, giant hogweed on the left, hemlock on the, on the right. Uh, it's a tall plant, hemlock. And uh, uh, again, uh, you wouldn't be uh, forgiven for mis misidentifying uh, hemlock for, uh, for giant hogweed. So um, yeah, difficulties in identification. So let's uh, just give you a, a little bit of a challenge in terms of, you know, what the uh, what the plants are so here's a, a photo that one of your teams sent you um a member of the public sent in for example is this giant hogweed yes or no this is number one number two you're driving down the um a38 and you see this um tall umbelliferous plant on the other side of the carriageway is this um a a plant that needs dealing with uh, is this is this giant hogweed number two early uh, season survey and uh, come across these uh, seedlings emerging on the edge of a, a, a floodplain area got a woodland woodland area is this giant hogweed other end of the season I'm um, doing a survey come across this um, large um, umbel of uh, of seeds, um, possibly giant hogweed, and uh, lastly um, here we've got um, a photo sent in again from one of the team. Uh, is this giant uh, giant hogweed number five? So number one, um, this is uh, common hogweed. Uh, you've got the um, just about make out the sort of lack of um, dividedness in the in the leaves, substantial leaves. Uh, you've also got size. Uh, you can see the nettles there. It's not uh, that huge a plant, um, and uh, also the way in which the leaves are sheathed. There are other features. I'd certainly encourage you to um, take the identification to another stage in terms of getting into a bit more detail. So, common hogweed. Um, tricky to tell and, and a nasty sort of question to sort of pose you, but this is actually hemlock on the other side of the road. 
um, giant hogweed be, would be uh, that much taller and also more substantial. Um, giant uh, hemlock is uh, much less less substantial in terms of, of, of its, its structure. Good clue here are the, the leaves at the top of the screen there, um, already last year's tap roots. Um, so the second year of growth of the giant hogweed, it's a, it's a, a plant that generally speaking grows over uh, two years. Seeds um, germinate, as you can see in the foreground, build up a tap root over the first year, second year, and they're the, the leaves that you can see at the top of the screen. Um, will develop, um, grow quite rapidly, create enough energy in the taproot then to send up in that second year the flowering stem, plant flowers, seeds, and usually will then die ready for the next uh, generation to come up in the following year. So yes, this is giant hogweed, and yes, those are uh, giant hogweed seedlings as well as last year's um, flowers, uh, as uh, leaves. Uh, no, not not uh, giant hogweed. This is actually uh, Angelica, um, the rather more oval, less umbrella shape, and you could should be able to see that the seeds are a, a, a much more substantial, less sort of papery thin. Um, and there are a number of these umbel, uh, as this type of flower, flower is called, seed head is seed head is called, uh, that are definitely uh, giant hogweed lookalikes and. Uh, Angelifica can be quite a big plant. Uh, yes, uh, again, again, just a, a good uh, ex example of the variation, slightly somewhat different from the leaf I showed you earlier, but it's it's dissected, saw leafed, and yes, this is um, this is giant uh, giant hogweed. Um, uh, this one crept in uh, at the end here, but um, actually this is again a, not a, a, a nasty one, but it is actually quite a good um, image of, of of hemlock on the on the right, um, showing you how how big a plant it is. But I think again you can see that it just hasn't doesn't have the substance; it's much more uh, branched than uh, giant hogweed. Uh, and on the left, uh, conveniently for the comparison, uh, is uh, the common hogweed. Um, so uh, a useful snap there just to, again, uh, look at two plants that I find people often mistake for uh, giant hogweed. And we don't want to be sort of going off the deep end in terms of spending lots of money and get everybody excited uh, where we've got our identification wrong. So we need to get into action um, where uh, where we've got a problem with this this plant. Uh, and first off, let's sort of recognise that we've got those sort of different stages in terms of uh, the invasion of a part like giant, giant hogweed. Um, from the left-hand side, uh, we're looking at the number of locations up the, uh, the y-axis and then across the bottom, it's sort of over time. So initially, uh, well, the, 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 there isn't any giant hogweed. Um, in the sort of setting the alarm clock prevention stage. Um, as the plant establishes in an area, um, we really ought to wake up to that and start to respond and respond rapidly. And then once we get through into the wide awake phase, um, we're, we're really going to have to just work away at dealing with the plant. It's uh, at various stages along that curve, obviously, it's, it's really really uh, got, got to grips and is going to be sort of more of a problem. So taking preventative measures, having a biosecurity plan associated with your property, etc. The work you do is really important to stop spreading the plant onto um, sites. Um, having the ability to respond rapidly, uh, identifying that that is a, a uh, an appropriate approach is really important. Uh, and then after that, we need to do the best best we can. So yeah, beware of relevant legislation. We need to do this correctly and we've got responsibilities. Um, and one of the first responsibilities we have is to um, reduce the risk and liability, particularly from people hurting themselves as a result of contact with the plant. And then let's assess the, uh, the hazards, uh, the risks that are posed. Uh, what are we actually trying to achieve rather than just a sort of reaction? Oh, my goodness, it's giant hog. We, we, we've got to we just got to kill it and kill it tomorrow type of approach.
you may not need to um, particularly do anything desperate about it. Uh, it. You may not need to do anything in a, in a hurried fashion um, and so on. Uh, pathways are really important. Um, let's identify them uh, and work out how they're being used so that we can actually include them in our control options, uh, a key part of, of dealing with the plant, uh, all leading to an invasive species management plan. Um, we've, we've written it all down, we've worked it all out, uh, and we've got something to work to, uh, but also ensuring that uh, we have uh, the appropriate biosecurity or our client has the appropriate biosecurity in order to make sure we don't uh, spread spread the plant around. Key to dealing with giant hogweed is managing its seeds. So firstly, we really want to try and prevent it from producing seeds uh, as best we can um, until the seed bank is exhausted. Uh, there will almost certainly be seeds in the soil from the previous year. Um, these can persist for quite a number of years, although on, on, a, on the whole, uh, it's around about five years that, that, that they're able to survive in the soil. Um, around about 95% of, of the seeds produced will germinate in the first year. There's a range of figures um, associated with that, but it's most of them. And then most of those seeds that didn't germinate in the first year um, will germinate in the second year and so on. So you can see that uh, you will get um, quite a dramatic reduction in terms of the amount of um, giant hogweed in the second year if you can prevent um, the giant hogweed seeding uh, in, the sort of in the current year, in the first year, as it were. And then in the third year, there will be significantly less. Uh, and most of these seeds are in the top top five centimetres. Um, so uh, that that's sort of helpful in terms of what you, what you need to achieve. So the management we can think of in two ways. We've got pathways, uh, which we need to deal with, severing them or disrupting them. And we've got control or in certain circumstances, we may even be able to actually eradic eradicate the plant. And in three different scales. Uh, we can work at the site scale, the landscape scale, or um, uh, probably uh, regional is a better word than, than national uh, in terms of, of dealing with this, this particular, particular plant. So typical site, um, here's a proposed uh, housing development. Um, uh, the, the bulk of the site down in the uh, left-hand corner, just outside of the site, uh, there's, a, there's another property that's also got uh, giant hogweed on it. So <clears throat> um, immediately sort of brings the sort of scale into play. Uh, we're dealing at a very local site sort of base level. That compares with looking at a more landscape scale. Um, here we're, we're, we're in uh, Hertfordshire um, looking at the distribution of giant hogweed uh, and you can see, uh, you can see that it's mostly associated with rivers. On the other hand, there are, um, you, you will be able to see a, a few um, outlier locations uh, where actually you could potentially eradicate the plant um, from that particular location in, in a one fell swoop. Uh, in the rivers, we're going to need to um, start at the top of the river and, and work down if we're going to seriously deal with the deal with with the plant. So just introducing these sort of different scales that we might be thinking about. Um, going back to the graph that I showed you. Um, pointing out that there's a, there is opportunity in terms of preventative measures. Uh, and I think you can see here that there are areas, particularly as you get more to the uh, north and west in Wales, and as you get up to the north of England and into Scotland, there are areas that don't have giant hogweed. Uh, and they they ought to work hard to try to make sure that, that that's the way it stays. So that there are um, good, good bases for preventative measures. But equally, there are measures uh, that can be taken um, in terms of uh, rapid responses uh, and also projects over periods of time. And, and a good example at this sort of regional scale is the Tweed Valley. Uh, I'd encourage you to uh, sort of have a look, see what they've been doing. Project started in 2002 um, and uh, they've just recently issued a, a bit of an update. Uh, this is a report from the Scotsman in 2000. 
and, and phi, which gives you a, a, a sort of a, an idea of the scale, uh, this sort of regional scale. Um, and the, the project demonstrates the importance of a sort of a coordinated, integrated approach. Uh, and 18 years on, um, yes, 18 years on, and they're still going. Um, they originally started out very much with an emphasis on giant hogweed, but as you can see from the logo on the front, they, um, they too have uh, moved over to uh, an emphasis on Japanese knotweed, uh, but a range of a range of plants within the catchment. So it's an, an interesting uh, study to uh, an interesting example to uh, have a look at, uh, and I, I'd encourage you to sort of follow that up. So um, pathway severance: we need local knowledge in order to work out, you know, where the plant might have been spreading from and into our site or our landscape scale area. Um, soil movement, water transport. Um, usual usual sort of issues uh, and the importance of working with local action groups, local groups um, neighboring and uh, as part of the area uh, in order to achieve an sort of effective control at that sort of scale. Moving up to sort of more landscape regional scales, we're going to need a champion. We're going to need a, a someone to coordinate and lead the project. Uh, we're going to need to raise awareness across the region, get a lot of people um, involved, almost certainly in terms of landowners and agencies. We're going to need to coordinate um, eradication control. We're going to need to sort of um, bring training in as part of the uh, of, of the project in order to achieve that. Um, and as part of that training, uh, we we need to be able to mobilise a potentially a range of giant hogweed control measures um, and I'll just run through some of these just to give you a flavour as to um, what uh, what they are and, and what one can do with them. So going for that first point let's get the seeds um, under control um, cutting off uh, with a pair of loppers the seed heads sticking them in a uh, polythene bag and appropriately disposing of them would be a, a good start also be a good idea for the person who uh, posed the photograph to be wearing gloves. Um, but uh, that is a uh, an, an initial uh, action um, that, that can be taken. Um, herbicide treatment is a, another uh, widely used uh, approach. Um, giant hogweed is uh, susceptible to glyphosate um, and uh, is it, it's important to be able to uh, get a good reaction from it. So working earlier in the year rather than later uh, makes a lot, a lot of sense, both in terms of the having, having enough leaf area, which is usually not a problem with giant hogweed, but not having too much of a plant to be struggling and working with. I also do think about um, using a herbicide treatment to just damage the um, giant hogweed. You can see where it's sort of the that the, the stems have fallen over here after a herbicide treatment. Uh, this site is going actually going to be cleared, um, excavated. It just makes the plant much safer to work with um, and uh, removes its sort of potential for, for damage. Uh, and we may need to excavate the whole lot, um, including the uh, tap roots, but also and mainly usually um, scraping off that top half meter in order to remove the seeds uh, where we're in a hurry and we need to get that site cleared usually as, as part of development. And then for smaller stands where you've got fewer plants, um, using a, a sharp spade um, and, and severing the taproot, chopping the taproot just uh, below the surface uh, is, is a very effective way of, of, of killing the plant. Probably unusual um, from a, a, a UK point of view, uh, is grazing, um, although these these sheep and they have been feeding on uh, giant hogweed uh, clearly enjoy it. Uh, note that they've got very sort of um, melanic uh, black muzzles, um, lips, uh, and that's quite important if you're going to use um, animals for grazing sheep, um, goats, etc. Uh, those with darker skin uh, are not affected by the plant. And then lastly, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, biocontrol, um, despite a huge effort to find a biocontrol agent, uh, been unsuccessful. Um, and the answer in a word is parsnips. Um, everything that was found that 
did damage giant hogweed, also damaged parsnips, uh, relatively sort of closely related. And then not a control measure, obviously, but part of the process. And I'd, I'd like to sort of emphasize the importance of revegetation, particularly where you've got large, large areas that you're going to be treating with giant, uh, giant hogweed. Uh, this is a sort of a uh, just a, an extreme scale. Uh, you can see the giant hogweed stems extending all the way back across this field. Uh, and yes, it is a field. And uh, you may be surprised to know that it actually was a field of giant hogweed. Um, we're in uh, Estonia and they grew the plant as a fodder for the uh, cattle over the winter, uh, particularly during the, it was a sort of a Soviet um, uh, Russia sort of approach to for milk production, etc. So um, not, where, not that we're going to encounter that, but we do deal with large stands and we should be including a revegetation package in order to stabilise the ground. So we need for our control eradication, uh, the site scale, we need to be looking at seed management, soil management uh, for small scale infest infestations, root severance is, is a good idea medium, large scale, um, try uh, herbicide treatment appropriate, but try not to uh, get involved in having to deal with um, excavations at the, uh, at the uh, other end of the scale. Uh, you're going to find this difficult to see. Uh, it's a flow diagram to help make decisions. So it's a good way of encouraging you to have a look at the PCA's guidance notes uh, on their website. Anybody can get access to it. Uh, which includes this figure, uh, one to have a look at and see how that might fit in with the work that you do uh, and, and the help that it might uh, provide you. Um, it, it's, it clearly is not a one size fits all, but gives you a good idea to help you in terms of decision making as to how best to deal with the plant. But the landscape and regional scales um, emphasise need for coordination, a strategic approach. Um, we, you, you need to have a, a forum, regional, local. Uh, you'll need targeted funding um, that is sustainable over the duration of dealing with the plant. And uh, you need to make good use of legislation. Um, sorry, the word forum just popped in there. It should just say use legislation. Um, there will be need for guidance and direction um, that funding will need to be targeted um, and yeah, Schedule 9 status, make, making use of the um, the recent act in terms of enforcement orders could all be uh, of value. Well, finally, a bit where we started out, just to emphasise uh, in terms of health and safety, um, direct contact with the plant is, is fairly straightforward in a way um, and is something that be, can be avoided. You need to know what the uh, what the plant looks like in order to make sure you avoid it, obviously. Uh, but if in doubt, um, you can take the necessary action. Indirectly is 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 more of a problem. And the example I've, I've used a number of times is a, a really nasty in incident where um, part of the team went out and was flail mowing through an area of, of parkland, part of which they went through uh, a stand of, the, of, the, of leaves of giant hogweed. Um, brought the kit back into the to the yard and another member of the team then came along and cleaned cleaned it all off um sleeves rolled up uh, uh and you can see where the story is going um sunny day uh, and this person um ended up in the accident and emergency um department in order to get the blistering and, and burns sorted out so it is something that 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 can be be passed on waste material uh, in bins uh, would be a, another example. So we need to bear that in mind in our management plan when we pull it together. Also sensitivity. Um, undoubtedly, some people are remarkably resistant to any effects from giant hogweed. Uh, doesn't seem to bother them at all. Other people are highly sensitive. Uh, I met a person who professed, uh, and she could certainly smell, she understood what I meant when I said you can smell giant hogweed from a distance. And she said, yes, I, I can smell it, but also I come out in, all tingly all over my skin and I feel really very uncomfortable. Um, and that's not having really got anywhere close to it, never mind touching it. So uh, we need to be aware of that. So 
um, those of us who are maybe less sensitive need to bear in mind that you know it isn't a matter of being wimpish uh, if you are sensitive it really can be quite serious for you so uh, if you're exposed what do you do um, where the skins come can in, come into contact um, with the plant or the sap really make sure you wash uh, with with water soap if you've got it um, and as, as soon as possible after contact keep the area the area of skin away from the sunlight for uh, sort of up to 48 hours is the recommendation um, and if necessary seek medical attention um, you can uh, get treatments to um, ameliorate the, the effects uh, but also when the blisters um, burst and what have you you don't want them to get infected and so on uh, and also you need to uh, look after your skin um, in the following months using sunscreen etc so um, thank you very much for listening i'd like to say thank you very much to uh, japanese not we limited florum um, and uh, peter at the property care association for providing some of the photos for me uh, and, and as well as Olaf Boy at the Non-Native Species Secretariat and uh, Shaka Yadava at uh, Charles University of Prague where they do quite a lot of work on, on, on this plant. Um, do uh, take uh, immediate precautions in order to protect people from this plant if you if you come, a, come across it as part of your work, that's your sort of first action. Make sure you assess the risks and come up with a balanced uh, uh, and rational approach to it. Uh, drawing up a, a plan, uh, an invasive species management plan, uh, and be prepared to follow up um, for at least three years afterwards in order to deal with um, seeds that have uh, survived or um, re regrowth um, in, in order to deal with that. And uh, yes, have, a, have some water available and um, a long sleeved shirt to put on just in case uh, you do come into contact with the plant. So, uh, as I say, thanks for listening. Uh, I'll pass you back to Andy for, for any questions, good ideas and comments. Well, Max, firstly, many, many thanks for that. As always, whenever you do any of our sort of presentations and conference, um, highly stimulating, highly interesting. And I can successfully tell you in terms of your identification test, I certainly, personally, properly sucked at it. That just goes to show the difficulty that there is out there in actually trying to identify the plant and also the different variants of the plant. There's also, I know, certainly from my point of view as well, I mean, I had no idea in terms of the reoccurrence issue was something that we really had to think about for years as well. So, uh, uh, but as you quite rightly said, I mean, we are on to kind of question time. Um, I will go to say right from the back, guys, um, you clearly love your questions out there, our invasive weed guys. Uh, I probably am not going to get through them all, but Max, let's rattle through them. And if I can maybe ask you, maybe to just try and keep your answers as brief as possible because we've got that many questions. But starting off right from the start, uh, right from the top, this one came in via email, comes from James Stewart. It follows on nicely just for you talking about health and safety stuff. You mentioned about the short, um, using a uh, long sleeve short shirt for protection. Uh, is this sufficient enough? Does this actually keep out the toxins or do we need to think more about it? And if we are wearing a long sleeve shirt, does it need to be proper thick or is it just a regular shirt? Regular shirt will be quite effective. You're trying to, you're trying to um, avoid the reaction of the sap on your skin in sunlight. So um, a long sleeve shirt will will pretty much do the job. If you're working with the plant in amongst the plant, then obviously, yeah, get, make sure that you're you're appropriately um, protected with with the right with the right kit. So um, horses for courses, really, but just bear in mind the principle: um, sap, sunlight, blisters. So you're, you're trying to stop that. Okay. Next one moves more on to a kind of technical question comes from Stephen uh, Worsley. Can you suggest the vertical depth and horizontal width that uh, giant hogweed roots cover on average? Well, giant hogweed roots um, will probably go down um, probably about 20, 30 centimetres at the most. It's a taproot, as I say, it just looks like a parsnip. 
So in terms of the spread of the routes, um, if that's not an issue. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, you can use a sharp spade to cut across the top of your tap root, uh, and that will that will do for the plant. Um, I think the question is looking at uh, is perhaps asking more about what area do we need to take into consideration in dealing with the plant, and then it's it's a matter of seeds. Um, and the DEFRA advice is that you would um, remove the top 50 centimetres and you would go out about four metres from, from the plant. So it's not like Japanese knotweed that you can follow the, the rhizomes away from the plant. Um, it would take an awful lot of effort to be sifting through soil looking for seeds and working out when, um, when there weren't any. So I, I would have thought on the whole it's better just to take... Um, that advice and remove out to that uh, that that extent uh, mm. chance of there being seeds that more more than 10 or 15 centimeters at four meters is is very small so you could sort of reduce the depth as you move away from the uh, the plants depending on the the size of the stand etc okay well the next question comes from claire hamilton it's all about seeds and seeds disposal how would you appropriately dispose of the seed head? Wouldn't that still be classed as control waste? And also, does burning kill the seed head? Right, so two parts. Um, yes, it, it is controlled. It would be controlled waste. And yes, you'd need to dispose of it to an appropriate landfill site or, uh, or an incinerator. Um, or if you kept it on on site, uh, let it uh, dry out, um, then uh, presumably you've got the appropriate permissions, etc. You could burn it on site. Uh, a bun burying it in a bun uh, would definitely work. Um, the, the, you saw the sort of size of the seedlings um, in the image I showed you. So uh, a bun and, and burying the material uh, would also would also work. Okay. Well, next question, guys, but just to kind of let you know, um, I'm trying to group the questions together because we've got that many questions that I've got here. But next question is all about the dangers of the plan. And it's a theme of questions from Sean Halfway, Richard Lee and uh, Amy Horn Norris. It's a two part question here. First part is, are the young plants dangerous? And on top of that as well, is common hogweed poisonous? And does it also cause blistering? Now, I will say this to you, Max. There is a little bit of chat, certainly, with regards to the common hogweed and whether it's dangerous or not. So you maybe want to address that. But also, as well, there is some recipes that are getting posted on for common hogweed also. We just a wee side note. So two-part question. Mm -hmm. So um, the so just remind me the first part. And are, are, are young plants dangerous? Yes, okay. And any, I think you have to assume that uh, any parts of the plants are, are potentially um, going to cause a problem. Um, I even had somebody um, have a, a reaction touching a dead uh, giant hogweed stem. Um, so you know, even, even the dead plant could produce a reaction in some people. So yes, and then certainly the younger plant younger seedlings, etc., cetera, uh, could do. Um, in terms of the sort of uh, common hogweed, um, the, these plants, the um, umbellifers, as, as they're called, that they produce these um, umbrella-shaped um, flower heads, white, usually white flower heads, um, a number of them um, can produce uh, a similar reaction uh, in people, and common hogweed is certainly one of them. Um, uh, again, people have differing degrees of, of sensitivity. So um, it, some people won't have, a, a, certainly personally, I've never had any problem with either plant, actually. Um, so it, it will vary, but I know other people are, are, are much more sensitive, and it could also apply to a number of the other umbellifers. Uh, and just as a sort of a, another word of warning, um, some of them are, are also poisonous, um, allegedly, Socrates was uh, was done for uh, using hemlock, um, and uh, people have have had serious reactions and, and, and extremes in terms of fatalities of eating various parts of the plant. So, the roots of water hemlock are, are particularly well known to be um, 
uh, very toxic. So a group of plants that you need to know what you're doing with uh, uh, and need to be careful. Uh, at, the, at the other extreme, uh, carrots and parsnips are both members of the same family uh, and we mm -hmm. seem to get all right with them. Oh, wow. OK, well, there you go, folks. Carrots. Uh, OK, next question. Just quickly moving on. Sean Hathaway, does heavy shade reduce growth and size? Uh, I don't know, Sean. Um, to give you a sort of a, an evidence based answer, my intuition would be that, yes, it, it, it would reduce the amount of growth because you've got less light. Therefore, there's less photosynthesis and less less growth. But I would expect the plant actually to grow more, if that's not a, a contradiction in terms, because it will reach for the light. So you could get longer leaves and, and stems. Um, but it's certainly an, an interesting one, particularly at that early seedling stage, using shading, etc. Might might actually be quite quite a, a good approach. Yeah, an interesting one. All righty. Uh... Okay, next question um, comes from Richard uh, Newis. Good morning, Richard. Um, how would you approach a cross-boundary issue where a neighbouring landowner refuses to treat their giant hogweed? A bit like some of these other plants and thinking particularly of Japanese knotweed. Um, first off, uh, if you can, try to sort it out between you. Um, so by definition, then um, try to avoid getting um, legal legal uh, with each other and the costs, etc. Um, the, the, the people who've got it in their garden next door, um, it, if they don't understand what they've got, obviously awareness, uh, raising the awareness of the problems associated with it uh, uh, would be a good start. And that's a that's that's an, that's an obvious one. Uh, but with a plant that is um, so so big and the seeds could spread in you know, a quite a long way and when it gets windy and so on, um, I would have thought that there would be scope to at least let let the neighbours know that uh, you know from a community point of view um, it was unacceptable of having having a plant that um, could cause problems, particularly for for younger people. Um, and that actually, you know, if 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 needs be, uh, the police or the local authority uh, could be asked to intervene um, with a view to uh, ultimately issuing a community protection notice. But that would need to involve more than you um, as an, an an individual trying to solve the problem with your next door neighbour. Mm. Apart from that, I can't think of, I don't know if there's anybody else on the line there to put in a chat as to any other suggestions that you have. Well, guys, you heard it there. I mean, as um, we don't pretend to have all the answers, if you want to throw any tidbits or advice, then please do just use the chat facility and let us all know. So that'll be an educator's all. Okay, next question. Next question actually comes all the way from down under, all the way from Australia. Max, and it's from the lovely Angela Jemson. Good morning, Angela, all the way in Australia. I hope you're safe and well down there with all the COVID-19 stuff that's going on. Can giant hogweed hibernate with common hogweed? Well, both, both plants will sort of hibernate, um, so to speak, in terms of uh, their seeds will remain in, in the ground over the winter. Um, and then um, given appropriate conditions, um, and both of them have a sort of a chilling requirement, so they need to be um, exposed to sort of relatively low temperatures. Uh, then they will germinate in, in the spring and uh, start off their sort of cycle of, cycle of growth. So um, from that point of view, they, they will over, be able to overwinter um, both species, though, die back as as the, the the plant, the plant that's growing, the plants that are growing this year will die back completely. Um, that they are the dead stems that you will you will see. Um, most of those plants will not regrow next year. That's it. They they have, uh, have just come to the end of their life their life cycle. Um, but those plants that were just leaves. Um, 
the leaves will die back and then those plants will so have hibernated, uh, overwintered uh, as, as tap roots, uh, and then the plant will regrow into its second year from those tap roots. So that's their second means of overwintering. So if you, a bit like if you don't, um, if you leave some of your parsnips in your allotment, um, they will in the second year go on to flower and fruit, uh, produce seeds, and then they'll die. But you then got parsnip seeds all over your allotment, which if you like parsnips, probably not a bad thing. Well, here, Max, so by the way, I uh, just as I was quickly scanning there, I've actually misread the question. It wasn't hibernate, it was hybridize. Um, but if I can also, uh, okay. can yes. also cross pollinate just from my own info. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, yes, uh, Angela, they can. Uh, quite unusual. Um, so, I wouldn't wor worry too much about it in terms of identification, but you're, you are correct, they can. Um, and, and there are hybrids around uh, which are of sort of botanical interest, but in terms of management, I've certainly never come across it as a particular issue. Uh, and it also is one of those hybrids that doesn't produce that sort of combined hybrid vigour. So it's an even more um, problematic plant because it's even bigger than giant hogweed. So um, it's a an interesting botanical phenomenon, but not one that I think needs to worry us. Okay, well, yeah, guys, just to let everyone know, I'll probably get time to squeeze in two more questions. Uh, any other questions which I've got, which I've got quite a few, um, I'm not promising anything, but I'll pass over to Max, and if Max can get back to you, then fabulous. But next question, Max, uh, comes from Joe Lear. Uh, does the plant only seed once? Yes, um, I'm sure there will be, I'm sure there will be exceptions, there always are. But yes, the, the plant flowers and seeds for, for, for that particular individual plant, it will flower, seed, and then that's it. All right. And one of the, one of the things just to very briefly add in that I didn't cover that uh, uh, is, is relevant is if you just cut the plant down, um, chop it off, say a foot or so above the ground um, and think that you've dealt with it, uh, think again, um, the plant will um, produce a, a side shoot from the lowest node, uh, flower and fruit. Uh, and it's, it, you can come across bizarre situations where you can see a whole field of a whole area of giant hogweed flowering at about two feet high. OK, well, last question, which is actually technically not a question. It's more of a reminder request, Max. It comes from Valerie Darwell. Please, can you remind us of the reference from Maxie's earlier quote from the gardener, i.e. perfect plants in churchyards? Um, yep, the quote um, was uh, from the gardener's magazine. And the gentleman who made the uh, wrote, wrote the note is John Henry and Loudon, L-O-U-D-E-N. Um, in, in, in answering the other questions that we haven't had time to deal with, Andy, I'll, I'll see if I can be a little bit more specific as to which volume of the uh, Botanic uh, Gardeners magazine this came from. OK, well, folks, as I mentioned, I will I will make sure that um, I pass over all these questions to Max. And again, no promises because <laughs> there is quite a lot of questions, but if Max can get back to you then, fabulous. But uh, moving on, just to, for those of you that are looking for a bit more information, uh, to start off with, you can go to the Invasive Weeds Library at the Property Care Association, where you will find a whole variety of technical docs, not only just on the management of <laughs> hallway, but also um, on the management and guidance for other invasive plants. The URL is just up there. It's just property-care.org forward slash invasive weed library. Um, another two references as well, that Max alluded to it over the course of his presentation. Firstly, giant hogweed management in the United Kingdom. This is actually from the very man himself, Max Wade, but also I know he did it in conjunction as well with the Environmental Agency and others. Certainly, um, we mentioned earlier on, Max pretty much wrote the book on it. That is the book. Go and get it for yourselves. Easy enough to look up. Other one as well as the umbrella umbrella fires of the British Isles, one I don't actually know too much about. Um, but also as well that if 
reading those books um, uh, and you're eager to learn more, I'm really chuffed to say that the PCA training is now back up and running. In terms of our invasive week courses, we now have the Severe and the Technician courses um, uh, up and running and also available. All I would do is ask you to encourage to contact our training team, Jade and Amber. Telephone numbers up on the screen there, 01480 400, uh, 400 000, or there's the lovely Jade's email just on the screen there, jade at property-care.org. Um, just so you have awareness, next week uh, for our next and the latest of CPD webinars, it's our very own James Berry, who's back on the stage again. His webinar all about atmospheric moisture and competent ventilation. Uh, there is also uh, another dampy related webinar that's very, uh, very quickly following off the back of that as well by our very own Steve Hodgson. We've not quite got a title for that, but it'll be along the lines of moisture management and buildings, I suspect, about remedial strategies and stuff like that as well. Um, last but not least, I just want to say a big, big thank you to uh, Max Wade for the really informative presentation today. I want to say a big thank you as well to all our audience that joined us today. Um, it's been a great presentation, Max. Many thanks again. And all it really leads me to say is a bye from Max, a bye from myself, and hopefully everyone has a lovely rest of the day. So bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.